At what point are entrepreneurs supposed to start having fun with their money? Honestly, <laughs> until you're making a lot more revenue than we are and yeah, you don't get paid much as an entrepreneur, yeah. but it's a fun journey, it's rewarding. The amount that you learn, you right. grow. Yeah. The money doesn't matter. Is there like a timeline to when um businesses can start making good revenue to a point where it can start paying you off as their founder? Yeah, so I think first of all it's really important for founders to be well compensated yeah. because you can imagine you're working 24 hours a day Absolutely. building this business yeah. and if you have good investors they'll also incentivize you by year 3 mm -hmm. to be taking a salary that is market value. Right, ladies and gentlemen, CEOs, welcome to another episode of Becoming CEO. And today we're just talking about one thing that affects every entrepreneur and that is funding because kupata pesa inakwanga too problematic. And I'm so excited for the episode that's coming up because we are going I'm going to sit down with our CEO and co-founder of a beautiful company that has been able to fund and get some funding for her business and I have recently been introduced to a new initiative it's called the Visa Everywhere initiative and this episode has been made possible uh through Visa Katesio Visa Everywhere initiative and allow me to read this because this is beautiful and mwanga ule mswa kuwa plug where you can get some funding for your businesses so please allow me to read this so Visa Everywhere initiative is an open innovation program that helps startups unlock new opportunities and gives them a global platform to demonstrate their groundbreaking solutions. The program first launched in the US in 2015 and quickly expanded into a global program. So Kenya I think should be like the first African country this the second African country uh that this uh, initiative has been done I think for the last five years if I'm not wrong. And uh to date over 12,000 startups have participated and have collectively raised more than 16 billion dollars in funding guys please check out visa everywhere initiative mtu yang 16 billion dollars si pesa kidogo man and the visa everywhere initiative is open to all startups first of all who offer innovative solutions to the payments and commerce challenges of tomorrow i'm going to drop the link in the description so check out visa everywhere initiative please if you're looking for funding and you're in this space all right let's get into the episode and get to learn sante ni sana Classmates Karibuni sana to another episode of Becoming CEO. Today I'm super excited because our lecturer for the day um we probably don't know her but we're going to learn so much about uh, about her and what she does. But most importantly, um I th I believe every entrepreneur, every businessman in this country struggles with uh getting funding for their business. and there's a beautiful initiative that has been started by Visa or has been there I've never heard about it so I'm excited to hear about the program it's called the Visa Everywhere initiative it's an open innovation program that helps startups unlock new opportunities and gives them a global platform to demonstrate their groundbreaking solutions we're going to talk more about that because funding getting funding for businesses is, is like the hardest hurdle so i'm pretty excited to yangu pakan kona notebook leo so please get your notebooks we're going to learn a lot today um uh, as usual becoming ceo is where we sit with men and women who've achieved success so that they can tell us a little bit more about their journey and how they got to where they are at so we're still filming at longonot place beautiful space beautiful environment please come check it out Thank you. And our lecturer for the day <laughs> is not other than Radhika Batu. I hope I got that correct. You did. I got that correct. The CEO and co-founder of Novu, uh which is an embedded wealth management platform aimed at building a savings and infrastructure and ecosystem. Yes, and they were part of a program by Visa Every Initiative. Yeah, and they got to win 10,000 USD. <laughs> Radhika, do you have some loose change from the 10,000 dollars? I wish share? I wish I wish I could take the money and buy a watch but no it's gone straight into the business. So at what point are entrepreneurs supposed to start having fun with their money? Honestly, <laughs> until you're making a lot more revenue than we are and yeah, you don't get paid much as an entrepreneur, yeah. but it's a fun journey, it's rewarding. The amount that you learn, you right. grow. Yeah. The money doesn't matter. My my company has been running for about a decade now and 
they are yet to pay me and <laughs> i'm getting to a point i'm like this is a toxic relationship at what point am i supposed to start making money no it's true i think by the fifth year you should be comfortable fifth so year. if it's been a decade Tindria. you need to have some words oof yes. and it, oh my goodness yes. okay that's that's in genuinely is there like a timeline to when um businesses can start making good revenue to a point where it can start paying you off as the founder yeah so i think first of all it's really important for founders to be well compensated yeah. because you can imagine you're working 24 hours a day Absolutely. building this business right. and if you have good investors they'll also incentivize you by year 3 mm-hmm. to be taking a salary that is market value right. so for example typically ceos earn anywhere from 10 to 15000 a year which is a, a month sorry Which Where? Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, no, yeah. they do. They yeah, do. Even right. in Kenya, some really well, mm-hmm. big corporations, right. really successful startups yeah. pay themselves that much. We're not there yet. <laughs> yeah, feel it. Please stop paying $10,000 to $15,000 a year. <laughs> no, but right. um, it takes time. You have yeah. to really achieve some key milestones. Right. And if you can... And the way we do it internally as founders, there's three of us. Mm-hmm. We say that if we achieve certain milestones mm-hmm. that has... 3x to 4x the business mm-hmm. so that's in revenue growing yeah. the revenue by 3x or 4x every year we give give ourselves a pay rise oh okay yeah that's, that's dope talk to me about ndovu yeah hey, yeah where did that come from oh so dovu is my baby mm-hmm. um we so a bit about myself i have spent over 16 years in finance so i worked at deloitte deloitte in mm. the uk All advising right. large pension funds okay. on how to take the money they have so they can invest it and pay their pensioners right and i realized very quickly that my skill set was not better suited in modeling and behind an excel spreadsheet mm-hmm. it was very good with pe- uh, people mm-hmm. so i moved over to blackrock the world's largest asset manager yeah i know yeah. blackrock wow yeah. okay yeah. and um there i was very much advising clients so corporations pension funds uh investment platforms on how to take the money they have grow it invest it and grow it and then they can generate more money or put back more money to the economy and then in 2019 so I'm Kenyan born and raised okay. i okay. decided to move back mm-hmm. i used to come back every year right and i'm i can't deny but this is the best place to live oh, oh it great is, weather it is. good food mm-hmm. humble people right um and so When I got back I was sitting with a bunch of friends and I asked them, "Hey guys, what do you do with your savings?" I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I mm-hmm. just didn't know what. Okay. And they said, "Listen, we earn money, but we either hold it in a bank, mm-hmm. which is my biggest nightmare, and right. I'll tell you why later." Okay. And or we actually, yeah, we just have it in Kenya shillings. Mm-hmm. And that's when I I got thinking. So if I'm going to do something, Uh, or create a business it could be around savings and investments so giving people the everyday kenyan access to global markets mm-hmm. locals as well but through the through the through your phone mm-hmm. cuz philip uh, yeah. or can i call you philip or yeah. phil <laughs> yeah. philip 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 okay, yeah. phil phil yeah. it's you can think kenyans are getting busier by the minute mm-hmm. so finance is something that you know you should be doing right but it's something that you don't know much about yeah. and it normally falls at the bottom of your to-do list right. so we wanted to make it easy for the everyday kenyan easy and simple mm-hmm. for the everyday kenyan to start their investment journey so they can achieve their financial goals right and of course i didn't know how to start a business i'd right. worked corporate for 16 years yeah. And I'm a little bit lazy. So I thought, <laughs> what's the quickest way to learn how to start a business? Mm-hmm. Um I sat with lots of CEOs. Mm-hmm. I just went for coffees. It was, you know, cold yeah. messaging on LinkedIn. You'll right. be surprised how many people answer. Oh, wow. Um and I just went for coffees with these CEOs and asked them, you know, how did you get into this and how did you build your business? Right. Um and then I heard from another friend of mine who said why don't you join an accelerator program. Mm-hmm. And what these accelerator programs do is they put like-minded people in one room. Right. And within six six weeks they tell you how to build a business and they teach you all these incredible learnings that you would have learned if you went to an MBA. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And at that time I didn't have two years. I really wanted to get my hands dirty. Yeah. So I joined an accelerator program and on day three I was making phone calls to my network to say, "Hey, would you invest uh in oh, global wow. markets or wow. the local markets and how much would you put in?" So we created this fake, not a fake, but a very simple website mm-hmm. that said Uh if you had the opportunity to grow your money by 12% on the dollar right. would you question mark yeah. if so how much would you invest mm-hmm. and during that program which was six weeks we were able to get commitments of 3.1 million dollars 
3.1. Yes, $3.1 oh, wow. $3. million. Dollars. And mm. so this was from our network. So we were three of us, so three sets of networks. Yeah. And that gave me the green signal that actually there's something here. Right. And yeah, and that gave uh, the, gave bought a birth to Dovu. I, I mean, you know, uh, a wealth management uh, program is not, or company is not a new thing locally. Mm-hmm. So what makes Ndovu so special? What sets you apart from the other companies? Yeah, so I think three things. Right. Um, so firstly is that we make it simple and easy mm-hmm. to help you get started. Right. So like financial literacy, it has mm-hmm. not been taught mm-hmm. at school. Right. A lot of us graduate, we start earning big salaries, mm-hmm. big relative, you know what I mean? We get yeah. start yeah. earning a lot of money because right. we've never had money before, mm-hmm. but we don't know how to budget. Yeah. We don't know uh, how to save. Mm-hmm. No one teaches us these things. Mm-hmm. And for us, what we do is when you first get started, we bring you along the financial journey. Mm-hmm. So Phil, you'd come on the platform mm-hmm. and we would ask you a series of questions to understand what is your ability to take risks based on your lifestyle, not what you think it should be, mm-hmm. but what is your personal unique ability. Okay. And then from there, we'll tell you, okay, Phil, you're a balanced investor. So why don't you start investing slowly in a money market fund, in the government, uh, the getting of government infrastructure bond. Mm -hmm. And then as you build your portfolio, we say, okay, now is a great time to invest in the S&P 500, which Mm -hmm. is a global market. And so the first thing we do is provide financial literacy. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we make it simple. Our KYC takes 60 seconds, um, which means you don't have to do paperwork. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, the model was you have to go see a fund manager, speak to an agent. They sign lots of forms. Mm -hmm. You give them photo ID. We've made it all digital. So we're making it easy. And then lastly, we're the first company in Kenya that allows you to invest in global markets with as little as 5,000 shillings. Before wow. this, wow. Okay, only the rich had access to yeah. global markets. Right. Um, if I came back here, I needed at least $25,000 right. to get access to global markets. That and I definitely did not have $25,000. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so that's what we do. We make it simple, easy, and, it, and it's definitely affordable. We, are, we have the most competitive fees in the market today. That is amazing for 5,000 Kenya shillings. You're right, because I, I, I tried getting into the whole money market thing and investing in uh, companies out there. And I was told the least I could start with was $10,000. Yeah, a million <laughs> shillings, give most, or take. Yeah, I was like, $10,000, just look at something. And amazing. you know what's interesting? Mm-hmm. You just said, I... The reason you said I was because not that you didn't have the money, Mm -hmm. but you don't know how to invest. Yeah. And when it comes to investing, it's emotional. Mm -hmm. So immediately you were like, I'm going to try this thing with $10,000. Right. And there's this weird feeling you probably got in your body saying, actually, I'm not going to do it. Right. And the thing with investing, Mm -hmm. it's not, you know, people nowadays are used to like instant gratification. Mm -hmm. You don't get that with investing if you're doing it the right way. For sure. You know, Um, so... This is why we have to allow people to start with small amounts of money. So then they start see the, seeing the value of it. Mm-hmm. And recently we had a customer, I had a customer call. I do these all the time. Mm-hmm. And she said, she sent me an email, just a couple of statements. She's like, thank you for helping my money grow. Wow. And that was so powerful. And yeah. she started off small. She mm-hmm. started off with the, the minimum 5,000 shillings. Yeah. And now every month she's doing three, $300, which is incredible wow. for mm-hmm. somebody who's just graduated. Yeah. Trying to figure out and build her financial career, it, yeah, it's it, it's amazing. Do the traditional money market funds in Kenya work? Because I I tried the NSC, I've done it for almost fifteen years. Uh, I don't think it's giving me the returns I'm looking for. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I have a I have a very Yes, I have a very different opinion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the money market funds work. So for those of you who don't know what a money market fund, it is a fund whereby you invest small amounts of money Mm -hmm. that is invested in low risk cash like instruments, which will give you an average return of eight to 12%, depending Mm -hmm. on the fund that you choose. Um, And those work. So I do think in Africa as a whole, Mm -hmm. if you invest in low risk cash like or bond Mm -hmm. which are basically seen as less risky they give you very good returns right but my challenge with money market funds is that the fees are quite high yeah and what happens is that that you in turn if you're earning 10 Mm percent you've paid two percent in fees so at you're taking eight percent home plus withholding tax it's about seven seven percent let's say Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you're just about outpacing inflation 
That's true. Right? Because the, ca- the recent inflation rate was 7%. Wait, it's even yeah. gone down. The last time I checked, it was at eleven percent. I know yeah. it's gone down. So it's this is this, this is this great is progress for yeah. us, yeah. which is great. Um, with the stock exchange, mm-hmm. so I'm a big believer of. So there's two ways to invest. Mm-hmm. So one is stock picking, which is you will go out there, Phil, and say I'm going to buy Safaricom, BAT, mm-hmm. uh, Equity Bank, NCBA Bank. Yeah. That's stock picking because mm-hmm. you're saying from what's available in the market, right. I'm going to believe that these five companies mm-hmm. are going to be the best performers. Yeah. yeah. That works really well if you are a financial expert mm-hmm. that knows how to uh, analyze market data, mm-hmm. um, has done this for a while. Um, but what we do at Dovu is say we do fund investing, which is like the money market fund. So in Kenya, you can also get an equity fund, which right. holds yeah. 60 companies that are listed on the Nairobi Securities Exchange. Yeah. Yeah. And... I think that's a bad idea because from our <laughs> Nairobi <laughs> Securities Exchange, yeah, yeah. there's only six or seven companies that are doing really well. That's true. That so true. if you look back as the whole index, so mm. the entire market, mm. over the last seven years, it's underperformed. Yeah. So what does underperform mean? It's mm. been generating negative returns. So yeah. if you put in a thousand shillings, you're getting 800 bob back because yeah. it's not performing well. What do you think is the cost for this? Is it the interest rates that were introduced? Uh, was our NSE running mostly from foreign funds and then we stop, they stop investing? What's happening there? So I actually think it's, I think fundamentally we have some really good businesses in Kenya yeah. and we do have the GDP growth that we see. So our economy has historically grown mm-hmm. um, month on month. Yeah. Um, I think that Kenya is, or Africa mm-hmm. is seven years behind India. And you all know that India has Hopefully. has done super well. Uh, there's been significant growth. Mm-hmm. And we do have the potential if we have the right regulatory bodies, corporations supporting different types of SMEs. Um, and, you know, we have the right tax laws, et cetera, to help us grow. So I think the challenge with the NSC personally is that there's not enough liquidity. Mm. So there's not enough movement of people saying, okay, I believe a company that's not the top five mm-hmm. is going to be doing well. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing is tax. You know, companies are not incentivized to mm-hmm. show great returns yeah. because then you'll be taxed significant amounts of money. Right. Um, so I think we just need to see a little bit more flow and you will then tend to see, see the performance of all these other companies come up. Right. So it's more around the f- lack of flow of funds and not enough trading mm-hmm. um, because there's different elements that drive the price up. Mm-hmm. So one of, of a company is how well you're performing, but also how exciting are you to yeah. other in, to other people out there? So let's take Tesla, for example. Yeah. Everyone knows Elon Musk. Yeah. We don't really know what he's doing with Tesla. No. Nope. Right? Like we don't nope. actually know if he's launching mm-hmm. a spaceship or he's <laughs> doing electric trucks now. Yeah. We don't know, but there's a hype around him. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, Mm -hmm. people buy his stock and that drives the price up. So again, and that's because there's liquidity, there's people trading it, and then you see more movement in the market. Mm -hmm. And that's what the NSC lacks here. Oof, okay, okay. Um, Let's talk about Visa Everywhere initiative. First of all, how did you hear of this program? I'm an entrepreneur. This is the first time I'm hearing about it. Like, how do I need to position myself to get to hear about such programs? So yeah. actually, um, because we're in the fintech space, and mm-hmm. of course, Visa is one of the strongest companies in that space when it comes to payments, card issuance. Yeah. Uh, they've always been on our radar. Mm-hmm. And so uh, through our networks, because we're a fintech, as soon as Visa sent this application, one of my investors actually sent it to me and said, Radhika, I think you'd be great for this program. Mm-hmm. And we internally had already discussed uh, wanting to work with Visa, MasterCard or the likes mm-hmm. in order to help us with cross-border payments. Right. So Dovu is currently live in Kenya mm-hmm. and we're regulated by the Capital Markets Authority. Mm-hmm. But we are moving into Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania and Zambia. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the payment rails, which is just infrastructure play. So in Kenya, for us to process payments, we're with one partner. Yeah. Um, when you move to Rwanda, you have to find another partner. When you move to Zambia, you have to find another partner. Right. So for us, partnering with somebody like Visa, who has a footprint 
across the African continent and then globally right. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and the initiative was to for fintechs or other companies to showcase what they're doing mm -hmm. and find ways as when and how we can partner with Visa. So for us, it was a natural fit because what we would like to do is create connectivity across the African continent. So if you're sitting in Rwanda and you are very interested in the government of Kenya bond, you can do a direct payment without right. having to change your Rwandese currency to dollars mm -hmm. to then change it to Kenya shillings. Right. So that for us was a key play. Um, and of course, they have strong infrastructure, they're competitive. So our, we just heard from our networks. And so if you're in this space, my advice would be to um, be part of groups on WhatsApp. By the way, the power of WhatsApp in Kenya is incredible. <laughs> okay, being a group, WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah, it just, that's how you do business here. Um, to the point where I have to now seg segregate my work phone to personal phone. Mm -hmm. Because by the time I'm done with work, I don't even want to message anyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because here it's used as a business tool. Right. So just being part of the right groups mm -hmm. um people are really welcoming to get have you added to them right uh and then you'll hear about these really exciting events so what happens in the program so you know you've applied and they've accepted you what does that program look like how i mean it feels like there's a whole competition that's even you know regional across africa how did that look how was that yeah like? i mean so first of all we were super excited to be shortlisted so right. there was about and i don't know the numbers but there was a large number of applications mm -hmm. so there was five of us from kenya selected yeah um and it was really well organized this is the first i've done several competitions right. this was really well organized mm -hmm. Before we got to the pitch day, I had three sessions with a consultant who does pitches for a living. Okay. So you went through it, you did your deck, mm -hmm. you presented your idea, mm -hmm. they fine-tuned it. Mm -hmm. um, it made you look at all the offerings that Visa has. Mm -hmm. So the main ones people know Visa for is payments, yeah. but yeah. they do a lot more. Um, so they do uh, issuance of cards, they mm -hmm. have a merchant payment uh, till numbers where you can pay with a QR code. Yeah. Um, yeah. They have the, all these incredible products. Right. And so it made you look through their um, mm -hmm. product line to say, okay, where do we see value? Mm -hmm. And then on the day, we had a pitch rehearsal the day before. It was quite daunting because yeah. it was on this big stage mm -hmm. um, and you, you know, with lights and and like we mentioned earlier offline, I said, you know, it's not natural to do these things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then on the pitch day, it was really well organized. We had Meg Whitman and a few other key industry leaders right. talk about the importance of fintech right. and how big corporations need to support fintechs right. to grow because that's how you bring up new upcoming co mm -hmm. companies to to be right. larger participants of the market. Right. Um, and yeah, and then we pitched. And so we won the Social Impact Award yeah. because at Dovu, what we help is allow Kenyans, Africans to create wealth slowly and responsibly over time. So that means, uh, and what success looks like to me is that, Phil, I have a mum nurse who works really hard to send, she's got three children. Yeah. And she knows she wants to give them a better life because she's seen so much struggle, mm -hmm. um, you know, always trying to make ends meet. Right. And through Dovu, she can save and invest yeah. for their university education. Right. And so when they get to the age of 18, she can send them abroad. And I think that is, um, that for me, it would be really powerful. That's the impact. That's why I do what I do. Uh, it's the most important thing. And somebody like Visa can help us get this nurse lady uh, into the digital economy because eventually once we partner with Visa, we can offer digital cards. So when her kid does go to university abroad, yeah. she can make online payments and be yeah. connected globally. And that really changes even your mindset as a as an individual. Once you're connected digitally, you understand the value of money, what you can do with it. And it just gives, it's a knock-on effect to bringing them into being financially included. Man, that is such a beautiful thing. I've never thought of that. Like, create a money market fund and um, just aiming and looking at uh, your kid's future. Yeah. You know, university. That's brilliant. So I, I have that. I have a son, Phil. Okay. He's 16 months. 16. Wait, it, wait, 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 wait. Okay, we'll, we'll, go, we'll, we'll get to that. Back. How did you go through this uh, competition with a, such a young baby? Oh, but yeah, we'll, we'll come to that. No, we'll so he's 16 that. months. Okay. And the day that he was born, uh, my husband and I put money away every every month for him. It's not a lot. We yeah, do about, a... uh, let's say like $120, which is about 15,000 shillings. Right. Um, and by the time he comes to 18, he'll have a million dollars. Because he's investing in global markets, 
and I don't need to worry about him yeah. because we have yeah. 18 years yeah. to do co consistent savings and we're not just saving it, we're investing it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. on average, markets give you anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. Some years are bad, yes, but yeah. t that's the average. Mm -hmm. And by the time he's uh, 18, he'll have a million dollars to his And that's a good and place to start from. Yeah. yeah and a... also any money he gets as, uh, you know, presents, aunties come over. Mm -hmm. I don't spend it. I just put it into investment account. Wow. And you can do that on Dovu. So I think it's, yeah. I know you have children. Yes. Uh, now's the time to start. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to start immediately <laughs> after this. Um, so a, a query I've had uh, that's been happening a lot in Kenya and in the startup phase where we see a lot of startups getting some really good funding. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, a few months later or a year later, the startup collapses. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what's happening. And you are at a phase where you've just gotten some funding. Mm -hmm. So what are you doing different so that six months, one year from now, we're not going to be seeing you in a news item somewhere? So first of all, working really hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's actually not the startup's fault. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think, you know, mm -hmm. building a business in this time, we're yeah. in a recession. Yeah. If we look back in history, when was the time we had a pandemic, a war, high unemployment, high inflation at the same time in the market? It's never happened. It's never happened. Yeah. So actually, um, building a startup anyways is hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you add these macro, so mm -hmm. these big macro things that are out of your control, and then you're asking founders to figure out how to build a business. And that's why they fail. I don't actually believe that they're not good at what they do. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is a blanket statement. So yeah. I'm sure there's, I know we've heard some unfortunate stories, but yeah. as a blanket mm -hmm. uh, statement, it's much harder to build. If we had started building this business, I'd, I'd say seven years ago, yeah. our valuation as a company would have been much higher, would have seen so much more money come in. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, a startup is about figuring out what works. And yeah. in order to figure out what works, you need a lot of money. Because That's you're true. running experiments, marketing experiments, on the ground events, uh, building and changing your product. This all costs money. Mm -hmm. And in this de this time right now, so over the last, I would say, 12 months, right. raising capital from other investors or investors in the market has been very difficult yeah. because, because of all these things going on in the macro environment, mm -hmm. the people that lend you lend investors money to give to startups mm -hmm. have decided that actually at this stage, Markets are not doing so well. We're going to pull back and we're not actually going to provide you so much funding. So liquidity, like funding has dried up from the main sources of funding. And the investors are also more cautious because they know that it's going to be a very difficult time. Yeah. So Phil, if you go out to race today, mm -hmm. typically it'd take you 20 calls to close your round. So let's mm -hmm. take your, um, again, this is these yeah. are my numbers and yeah. not, not yeah. anyone else's. But right. if I was doing a million dollars, give me 20 calls and I can close it. Right. But today, if I went to raise the same million dollars, yeah. I'd probably need to have 200 calls. Oh. And the reason being is that there's not enough capital mm. that is easily flowing. Right. But there's beauty in this problem. Mm -hmm. I'm very grateful that if we were to experience this cycle of bad economy, uh, economic health, mm. you know, high inflation, high unemployment, cost of living crisis. Yeah. I'm glad it happened very early in my journey because when you're getting all this money coming in from investors, you're building a business that's such a high pace, you're not focused on the fundamentals. Right. Whereas this year, because we had, to, we knew that this is the strategy, money's very difficult to come by. Yeah. We paused in the months of January and, and February and we re-looked at our strategy and fundamentally, my business is that much stronger today because I know exactly where my revenue is coming from. Right. I know exactly how to grow my revenue. If I was to put more money to one channel, mm -hmm. I know that's how I can acquire more customers. Right. That wouldn't have happened if I had a lot of money to play around with mm -hmm. and you were just trying to do things simultaneously. So you're not getting the insights you need to build a strong business. Right. So the way we're managing it today was uh, we went on the defense, mm -hmm. which simply means you cut costs, mm -hmm. uh, you focus on your core business, you're not trying new things to figure out how to add to revenue. Mm -hmm. um, but now that we understand that, I think we're ready to go on the offense, which means there's a lot of history mm -hmm. or a lot of data that shows that if you, in a market downturn, yeah. a lot of people become defensive. So everyone's yeah. taking money out, they're growing slowly. Yeah. Yeah. But if you wanna be a market leader, at a certain point, you need to become more on the offense yeah. to acquire more market share. That's true. 
And I feel the last six months, we've now better understand our business. And now we are looking to go on the offense, mm -hmm. which again means we need to fundraise. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we're, we're still haven't decided yet, but we're figuring things out. Mm -hmm. uh, but that will be the game changer for us because we're no longer scared. We mm -hmm. know what we built is something that people actually want to use. Yeah. Now we just need to acquire more of those people and we finally understand how to do that. So it's, it's a very difficult decision making. Yeah. It's scary. Yeah. Yeah. As a founder, you know that actually the name, everyone's telling you there's not enough capital out there, mm -hmm. conserve your capital. Right. But for you to be the best company in the future, mm -hmm. you need to take some risks. Absolutely. So Absolutely. the question is, what is the timing of the risk? What is the risk you're taking? Um, and it has to be very well calculated. And as you know, you run your own business. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you make business decisions that don't lead to the outcome you wanted. Every day. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> um, exactly. And you're doing all these amazing things with a young baby. How has that been as a <laughs> mom? You know, your son is 16 months. So basically you've been doing this whole fundraising, looking, relooking into your business. Probably a child who had not even turned one year old. Yeah, Man, so I had, my, <laughs> I, I had my baby first mm -hmm. month and then I was back to work. But I will say one thing. Right. I'm the person that believes that I can do it all. And it just comes from fundamentally from a childhood saying, mm. I can do whatever I want in this world. Okay. And I've never limited myself to the belief that I can't do everything. Right. It obviously comes at a cost. Yeah. Mm. I would love to have spent, like in London, you get a, a one year maternity leave. Mm. I know in Kenya it's shorter, yeah. Yeah. it's much shorter, but I would have loved to spend that time mm -hmm. with him, you know, yeah spending those beautiful moments with him. Right. But the way I rationalize it is that I'm building this for him. For him, yeah. And actually in this modern day, you have a lot of help. So, you know, I have a great husband who's always supportive. Right. Never once does he ever make me feel guilty about working so hard. Right. Um, I have a very, uh, you know, being Indian, uh, even actually Indian culture is very same as the African mm -hmm. culture, you know, aunties, uncles. Yeah, it takes a village are. to raise a child. Yeah. They're always there helping out. Oh. And I've actually built in a very strict routines. Mm -hmm. And I think the organizer is my best friend. Okay. So if you're able to just manage your time wisely, you can spend the quality time uh, with your children as well as building a business. Right. So for example, in the morning, I have him from seven to nine. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I don't have my phone with me at that time. It, it's all attention on him. Wow. And then I come home at six, mm -hmm. six to 7.30 is, I chuck my phone somewhere, my yeah. team can't get a hold of me. Mm. If something's burning, it'll have to be dealt with at 8 p.m. Right. But I, I managed to spend quality time with him um, and that works for us. And then on the weekends, I very rarely do any work. Okay. I do do some work when he's sleeping, but mm. um, I try not to, when he's awake, to make any other social plans. So I'm less social than I used to be. Right. But right. it's a sacrifice I, I think is worth making. Yeah. Two things you 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 pointed out are uh, something about your childhood, and it just gave you this focus that you have. Mm -hmm. How was your childhood like? How did you grow up? What you, was your family setting? We're always curious about you know how we are raised and how that affects and determines if we'll be successful in the future. So that's a conversation we have here. How is that like for you? So that's so interesting because recently I've been doing a lot of personal inward work as well, All which right. I'll tell you about in a minute. Okay. Um, but growing up, I we didn't grow up from, like, we weren't rich. Okay. We grew up with humble beginnings. Right. And I was always surrounded by my grandma and my mom, who okay. both had their own businesses. Oh, okay. So my grandmother uh, launched a business that is now handed on to my brother. So I, it's, I find that amazing amongst your community, how you yeah. guys are able to pass on businesses across the generations. Yes. And yeah. just think about it. In the 1960s, a female built a business that is still existing today. Wow. And she's still alive. So I am like, she is the queen of the, yeah. the kingdom. <laughs> yeah. And um, and my mom had a side hustle business. So she was looking after the kids whilst my dad worked, but she had a tailoring business mm -hmm. and she was very successful in her own right. Mm -hmm. um, and in our household, we were just always encouraged to try things. It was never, no one ever said, you can't do this. Right. And I think that makes a big difference on how you then grow up to try things. 
Um, you know, we failed at things, but it was never like, why did you get these bad grades? You know, mm -hmm. typically if I came third in a class, my parents won't say, why weren't you first? Which is right. what you normally hear. Yeah. yeah. It was more like, oh, well done for, uh, for coming third, but next time try your best to come second. I love that. Yeah, so it wasn't like, why didn't you? Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, it's okay, you did really well mm -hmm. and and, and uh, you can do better next time. And then when I was 11, I lost my mom. I'm sorry. Uh, and I think that was the biggest lesson in life. I had to grow up very quickly. I was sent off to school without, because dad was like, I can't handle this. You know yeah. how it is, men can only do one thing at a time. I mean, we are not built. <laughs> We're not built for that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had to grow up very quickly. And very early on, at the age of 16, I was independent. So oh. you were making real life decisions right. about your life that will impact who you're going to be right. then. And even if I asked for my dad for advice, for example, what should I study at university? He'd mm -hmm. tell me, what are you good at? He never gave me the answer. And mm -hmm. I used to find it so frustrating mm -hmm. because I used to see my friends mm -hmm. who have their parents saying, oh, you should look at these three careers. Right. He never did that. He said, okay, what are you good at? What do you enjoy? What do you think you can do with this? So they were always the right questions. Yeah. And at the time, honestly, I didn't see the value in it. I was actually annoyed with him for quite some time because <laughs> you just want yeah. some guidance. Yeah, you, you should know everything. You, you're like my hero. You're, you're yeah. my dad. You know? I, in my eyes, you're like, dad, dad knows everything. He's yeah. done well. Like yeah, right. what? Um, and that decision-making for me has been critical. Um, and even today, my husband will say to me, you never take stress. I don't know how you do it, but you're never stressed. Mm -hmm. And I said, because in my mind, I don't think anything can't be solved because I was never brought, brought up to believe that you can't do this. Right. Um, you can be whoever you want to be. You just have to figure out how to do it. And it's not going to be easy. Right. But you navigate it and you ask for help. Um, and so that just taught me throughout my entire career, I always asked for things, I asked for help. So even when I was at Deloitte BlackRock, if I wanted to get somewhere to a position, I'd go and ask someone who's done it, almost mirroring the things that they did for me to get there. Right. And today in the entrepreneurship journey, it's a whole nother world because I am doing things I have no idea about, mm -hmm. meaning I've never done marketing before. I'm yeah. a finance person. Yeah. And you need to know as a CEO how to hire the right marketing person. But then again, I, I recognize my weakness, that that's not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. So I called an investor who has a huge background in marketing and got him to do the interview for me. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. The, the areas that you don't know and you don't, rec you don't have any strength in, just ask people who do. And oh, people yeah. are, it's human nature. We love giving. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, if absolutely. we can, if we feel we're growing someone or we're mentoring them, we will do it, even if we don't have time. Absolutely. So I think the key has been, Recognize your weaknesses mm -hmm. and then ask for help. Right. Um, because again, Rome wasn't built in a day and it definitely wasn't built by one person. That's true. That's so just super. ask for help. Oof. It's interesting. This this week I was reading up on something or came across something and uh, this, this was a survey done by the CIA mm -hmm. and how they recruit their, uh, uh, the people that work for CIA. And the longest running study that has been done in the CIA and they were saying that there's a there's there's just a relationship between people who've experienced trauma mm -hmm. as they were growing up and success mm -hmm. and just the right amount of trauma and hardship will pro propel you to success and just listening to you losing your mom at such a young age and you just being thrown into the deep well like at 16 you're making decisions yeah and wow it's it's a it's factual. So are you saying that all of us should experience some form of trauma? <laughs> no, I, I'm just, I wouldn't yeah. wish that on anyone. No. But yeah. I do think it makes you resilient. Yeah. 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 It, does. it makes you are just a different person. Mm -hmm. And I see it now more so with my friend circle. Right. Because we're all having to make the hard decisions mm -hmm. because life is hard. The older you get, it gets yeah. harder. Right. And if you've had to do those decisions at a very young age, mm -hmm it doesn't feel like a hard decision. It's just something you have to do. Yeah. Whereas some of my friends now mm -hmm. who have, you know, had like the p picture perfect family mm -hmm. and they're having to make hard decisions are struggling because it's a new emotion. It's a, a new way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, nowadays we're exposed to anxiety, stress, right. um, limiting beliefs of mm -hmm. I'm not good enough to do this. I'm not good enough mm -hmm. to deserve what I 
should be getting. Right. Um, because social media makes you feel that way. That's true. You know, it's it's beautiful, but it's also a curse. <laughs> Um, yeah. And I think it's true that if you had to grow up with a bit of trauma, right amount, yeah, right amount, <laughs> it can make or break you. Oof. Yeah. Something you mentioned also is uh, sacrifice. You you're having to sacrifice a lot, especially for your son to build his future. And um, you know, I've always had this statement that you know, each one of us, you have to sacrifice something to achieve mm -hmm. some level of success. What has that been for you? I know you've mentioned on the family bit. Yeah. Has it always been that? It's a good question. Yeah. Um, so I've been doing a lot of inward work, I was telling you. Yeah. And um, I think in this day and age, a lot of people think su success is overnight. Mm. And it's not. Oof. Thank you. Please yeah. tell them again. Please tell them again. <laughs> Everyone thinks they're going to become an influencer. That's right. And they're going to make lots of money. Yeah. But actually, it takes a lot of hard work. Absolutely. And when you start calling sacrifice hard work, it changes your mindset mm -hmm. because it's no longer you're giving up something. You're actually working hard towards a goal that will help you be great mm -hmm. in your 40s, 50s, 60s. Absolutely. So I was doing a lot of inward work and um, they say that uh, you have four values that you relate to most. Okay. So one is uh, certainty, which is having a routine. Mm -hmm being able to know where your next move is coming from. We all relate to all these four values, but we prioritize it differently. Okay. The second one is significance. Like you want to leave a legacy behind. You want to be the smartest person in the room. You want your friends to think you're the smartest person. Um, you want, yeah, so it could be yeah. different things. So yeah. these are just examples. Yeah. Yeah. The second one is variety, mm -hmm. um, which is like you want to try new things, a new restaurant, you want to travel a lot. Um, there are good thing, good ways to do this and bad ways, but I'm only t talking about the good ways. Yeah. Um, you want to grow in your career constantly. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is love and connection. So you need certain types of relationships to be going well in order to be happy. And so I've been doing a lot of inward work to say, okay, what are my two key values? Mm -hmm. And they change it over your lifetime, over what you're doing. Right. And at the moment, I could say significance and variety are really important to me. So I want to make something of myself. Okay. And that might have come from the fact that when I was young, you know, I lost my mom when I was really young. Mm -hmm. I had to grow up in an environment where I always felt, you know, we were studying abroad. You mm -hmm. never really belonged. Yeah. And if you're successful it gives you significance right. and so everything that happens in your childhood makes you to value one more than the other that's true and the other thing is growth for me so if i'm i couldn't be doing a corporate job anymore like mm. doing the same thing day in day out and not mm. learning would be yeah. very difficult mm -hmm. or different mm -hmm. and so at the moment i'm sacrificing in my mind love and connection because I'm not spending that much time with my family right but what this exercise helped me do was identify that and ideally, I want to move a little bit more towards love and connection. Okay. And so every decision I make now is based on, okay, does this add to significance or variety? Mm -hmm. So if it's going to be certainty, I can say no to certain things. Right. Um, but then I can fine tune it towards saying, okay, I want to spend more time with my family. Um, and I do a lot of, um, it's really structured. My day, my calendar is structured. Right. Um, my It's weird, but my husband and I have alone time. We have date night. That's amazing. Yeah, we have family day mm -hmm. and we don't let anything else come in the middle of it. Right. Um, and I think that's what really helps you say, okay, if I'm going to sacrifice this part of my life, I know in the future I'll get my time back. Um, and these are the sacrifices I'm willing to make today and I'm going to be okay with it when I'm 40. Right. Uh, but it takes a lot of self-work. Oof. Yeah, it's quite deep. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Sorry about man. that. No, no, no. I love it. I, I love such conversations here. So what's the most difficult uh, decision you've had to make? <laughs> to f Yeah, in your journey, like that one decision. Changed everything. Yeah. And you <sighs> had to sacrifice a lot or something yeah. big for that decision. <laughs> so I think it's spending time with my children. Mm. Uh, well, child. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My husband's a child too, so, you know, <laughs> him too. We're um, always the first ones. Okay. Always, mm. always. Mm. Um, no, so I think it's not being there with your son through his formative years has yeah. been the biggest. But from a business sense, actually, mm. when we were setting out Dovu, mm. we had two decisions that we could take, two parts, sorry. So one was to build quickly and mm. get to market quickly, which right. meant that you would 
uh, borrow someone's regulation because mm. it's a regulated business mm -hmm. and you would borrow someone's technology to launch a product. Yeah. And along the way, you would then pay these two partners a part of your revenue. Right. Or the second decision was to acquire your own license and to build the technology in-house. Mm -hmm. And that was a really difficult decision for us to make very early on because funding, obviously, when you don't have an idea, you have to sell your vision. Mm -hmm. It's hard to come by. Right. Um, and we knew that if we took this easier route, which mm -hmm. is the first one, we can get to market a lot quicker. Right. But at the time when we did the um, financial economics of the the two parts, right. what we recognized was that even if we grew very quickly, mm -hmm. this first route meant that we would be giving away a lot of our revenue. Mm -hmm. And even though it was faster to market, right. and this is why it helps to have co-founders who are older. So both my co-founders are in their 40s. Okay. We made the decision to take the harder route. Mm -hmm. And you probably might have seen a meme on Instagram or something saying, you know, the harder route gets you to better lifestyle and future in the future. Mm -hmm. The easy route doesn't really get you where you want to That's be. True. True. And it's almost like now that is linking back to this one decision. <laughs> yeah. So we decided to do everything in-house. Mm -hmm. We got our license in six months, we mm -hmm. built our tech in six months, but we weren't generating any revenue, but we were just investing in the right. underlying. Right. And that was really difficult because you could see other market players who chose route A. Mm -hmm. But now in difficult times like this, yeah. actually doing that has by far made us the strongest company out there in this space right? because we own everything, our revenue is ours, and we can change our product as we see fit because we're not relying on a third party to then go and you know explain it to their team, right. get the team organized, do it. So everything moves at a much faster pace. Mm -hmm. But that was actually a very difficult decision to make at the time because naturally you want to take the easy route. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was just... Uh, the fact that we're slightly more uh, older in mm -hmm. terms of a lot of entrepreneurs are in their 20s, mm -hmm. they're still learning. We said that actually in the long term, if we build this business that's sustainable, right. this is what we would like to have. Yeah, Not the let's partner with other people and don't really own anything in the end. Right. Uh, so yeah, that was a very, very difficult decision to make. Oof. Something you've kept mentioning throughout our conversation is how routine you are and how you plan your day to the letter. So... How does your day look like? How do you block off your time? How does that work? So um, I make sure to do something that I do for myself mm -hmm. so that I'm happy. Right. Um, I make sure to do... So let's start from when you wake up. Okay. How does your day look so, like? So typically... <laughs> what time um, do you wake so up? So at the moment I'm pregnant, so it's a little different, but... Oh, okay. Um, well, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, but before pregnancy, I'll, I'll go through that day because that is my typical day. Mm -hmm. So I normally wake up at 5.45. Okay. I hit the gym. Right. So I go to F45, guys. If, if you want a morning kick, mm -hmm. F45 is your class. It's in Lavington. Lavington, F45. Yeah, it's a high-intensity workout. Right. And that's what I do for myself. Okay. So okay. that is my... It helps me. So you know some people go speak to a therapist mm. or they will... Yeah, you have your vice. Right. If I've worked out, my mind is set for the day. Right. Come back... Uh, shower, I would meditate for 15 minutes, mm -hmm. which is very important because as an entrepreneur, you're being pulled in so many different directions. You can't think clearly sometimes. When you say meditate, what does that mean? You know, we, we always think of these people who sit quiet. And, yeah, so this, yeah. that's a really good question, Phil, right. because meditation is personal to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, I do meditate. I use, a, uh, I use an app called Calm. Okay. And you can do it with your eyes open, you can do it with your eyes closed, you can do it sitting, lying, whatever suits you. I do 10 to 12 minutes um, mm -hmm. in a quiet area uh, before my son wakes up. Right. And I, yeah, I just meditate. So I'm listening to somebody talking, something about personal growth. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I was pregnant during my first trimester, my form of meditation was walking in Jaffrey's, mm -hmm. but having a podcast mm -hmm. and just walking. And I walked for 45 minutes. Right. And that was weirdly calming. It gave you the same effect as meditating okay. because you're doing the same exercise over and over again mm -hmm. and you're just walking. I'm not looking at people, I'm just listening. And so there's different ways that meditation can be done. Mm -hmm. I would say that sometimes it feels, a lot of people say you need to meditate in the morning. So I know some friends who say, I can't meditate in the morning because as soon as I get up, I'm, I've got 10 things to do. Yeah. So sometimes meditation works better actually in the evenings when you've showered, 
oh, you're just about to go for dinner, like go downstairs for dinner. Mm -hmm. You meditate for five minutes. And it doesn't have to be 10, 12. I prefer to do 10 to 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You can do it for three minutes. Okay. And you build that habit over time. All right. Um, and then obviously I've got my, that power hour with my son mm -hmm. and he's like, mommy and this and that, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. just playful. Um, but the night before I already know what I've, I've got scheduled in my diary. So right. do I need to be in the office at a certain time? Am mm -hmm. I, do I have a meeting? Mm -hmm. um, and the only recently have I learned this skill. Mm -hmm. My team is excellent now. It's taken me, I'd say two and a half years to build a stellar team that I trust mm -hmm. and now I delegate. So Phil, the only thing I do is I'm no longer doing stuff, creating documents. And you can imagine at the beginning of the company, you're setting up all the rails. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a lot. Mm -hmm. Finally, now I get reporting and I sit there and I ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think, okay, if there's a blocker here, what else can we do? What phone calls do I need to make? Who do I need to speak to to get a view, different view on this? Right. And that's what a CEO should be doing. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> But in a startup, you at the beginning, you are the CEO, yes. the product manager, the yes. customer service. Yes. And it's taken me two and a half years to get to this position. Wow. Um, so the, when I look at my calendar, the first question I ask myself is, can I delegate this? Mm -hmm. I delegate it to the right person. Um, the second question is, okay, does this add to revenue? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, I, I, I sometimes, normally I just delete the email. I know right. it's really bad. Um, <laughs> and then if it comes up again, then maybe there's some value in it. And then I look at the key things that I need to do to help the team mm -hmm. get through what they need to do. Right. So about a whole day of work, mm -hmm. then I come home. And I, the one thing I think has, I've never been spiritual, but since my son has been born, the one thing I do when I come home is I play with him. And then before he goes to bed, we do two things. We pray and then okay. we do our gratefulnesses. All right. There's something in the gratefulness. Mm -hmm. And it's basic stuff. Like I'm grateful for the meeting that I had today that went well. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for the food we eat. I'm grateful. There is something in those gratefulnesses that has yeah. changed. I don't know whether it's that, but yeah. it just, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting thing. I've never been spiritual before. Right. I found it obviously as, as, as I became a woman, um, right. a mother, sorry. Right. And yeah, and then in the evening, it's dinner time with the family. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there's work events, so right. you have to manage your time around that. Mm -hmm. And then on the weekends, I make sure it's family time. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, that's a fully packed day yeah, <laughs> and, so, and so well planned out. And, you know, Something we were talking off cameras before we started, and that's building a personal brand oh. and putting your name out there. You know, like I'm sure the main reason we are even having this conversation is because you're putting the name Dovo out there yes. and you're putting yourself out there. Um, tell me how that journey has been for you, because you told me you're not the one to be found in front of a camera. And here you are, I speaking know. so well. <laughs> yeah, how's that been like for you? Oh, Phil, so unfortunately we live in a time yeah. where we have to put ourselves out there because people consume products of founders they like. That is so true, that is so true. Not necessarily the product itself. No. It's a different, we're, we're not, you know, I look at these traditional manufacturing businesses or that have come up 15, 20 years. Yeah. No one even knows the founders, but yeah. they're these huge businesses mm -hmm. and they're doing so well and yeah. they're not in the limelight. Right. And I never want to be famous. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather be successful, but never famous. famous yeah. And so for me to put myself here mm -hmm. takes a lot of mental prep work. Wow. So even before I got here, you know, I had to, visualize how this conversation would go, you know, organic, yeah. saying the right things, yeah. thinking about what you say, take a breath. Mm -hmm. I had to tell myself all those things because it's not natural. Right. Um, <laughs> and so doing this for me is a, things I like to do, yeah. things I have to do. It's ah. in the things I have to do. Ah. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. and I have another co-founder, Ro, which I've been trying to encourage mm -hmm. to do more of these things. And he's like, it's not for me. It's and for me. so I have to take one for the team. Right. How, how important is content creation for, for your company as a marketing tool? And it, how is that going for you? It is imperative. Mm. We have to do it. Right. So one thing we learned was, and this is a great learning for people who are starting businesses in Kenya. Right. The Kenyan market is both online and offline. Yeah. And the more conversions you'll get is actually by doing offline things, such as um, speaking at events, uh, doing 
on ground activations, so mm -hmm. going and speaking to your customers. Mm -hmm. Digital is a great tool to right. get, build trust. Mm -hmm. And what we found is because, of course, financial education is not, mm -hmm. it's not readily available, mm -hmm. or people just don't have it, creating financial content has been imperative for us. Mm -hmm. We do this, the team gets involved now. Mm -hmm. Uh, we try and get out at least 12 pieces of content content a week, Oof. which to be honest, like you said earlier, <laughs> that's what you're meant to be doing a, a day. day. Yes, as I learned, you need to be putting out about 15 pieces of content a day. A day, day. Yeah. yeah. So we're doing this as a team, mm -hmm. 12 a week on right, average. Right. Um, and it's almost this education leading to acquisition mm. and it takes time. Yeah. And as a founder, you come in, you're hungry, mm -hmm. you want Rome to be built in a day. Yeah. And then after a year and a half, you realize, no, this is a journey. Right. And you need to figure out what is working. And mm -hmm. for us, financial education is working. So we create content. Like, so we do webinars, mm -hmm. we do short videos. Mm -hmm. uh, we partnered with some big influencers to, to just disseminate strong financial content into simple ways that people will understand. Absolutely. We just launched our TikTok account mm -hmm. because the reality is that 60% of the African population is the youth. Yeah. So yeah. they're the ones coming into financial, mm -hmm. um, uh, coming into the next financial generation. And right. they're the ones who will be the savers and the investors. Mm -hmm. So you have to meet them on four or five different channels. Yeah. It's, <sighs> it's hard work. work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. I, um, yeah, I was looking at somewhere else. Where was anyway? But right now, uh, content creators in companies are earning as much as the engineers in the company because they're both equally so important. There's no growth for your company without content creation. And woof, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work. So one of my investors told me you need to build the investment platform and then you need to build the media house. You're building two companies. That is so true. That and actually, so true. that's what it feels like. We that's spend so much resource time building mm -hmm. and creating all this amazing content, right. which you don't know initially if it's making an impact, but now we can say, yes, it's yeah. leading to conversions, right. um, but you're still building this investment company. Right. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a tougher market. <laughs> Oof. I mean, I have loved this conversation. We could go on and on and on, but um, Rathika, thank you so much for coming through to becoming CEO. It's been an amazing conversation. And, you know, I want to grow my wealth and I think, you know, I'm going to hit you up immediately after this conversation and I'm going to drop a link on the description. Uh, just check out the website, check out the platform, see what they're doing. Amazing work. I'm also going to drop a link to Visa Everywhere Initiative on the link as well on um, the description. Check it out as well if you're a startup, if you're a founder. Um, I think it's a beautiful program if you want to grow globally and be a uh, Exposed. We've been having the Becoming CEO conversation at Longer Not Place. Amazing suit. Yeah. Uh, come through, check it out. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Phil. And you are amazing in front of the camera. Please. Am I? <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't Make it feel natural. like it. It doesn't feel like No, no, no. You're very natural. And oh, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so All much right. for having me. Classmates, sit on next episode. <laughs>